Garrett Kramer is the founder of Inner Sports, um, a, a company which men mentors athletes, um, but also coaches, parents and organisations on the state of mind that lead to excellence. Um, he's written two books. Um, the first one I can really, really vouch for and the second one I'm looking forward to. Um, Garrett's first book, Still Power, was my introduction to him a couple of years ago. Um, and I, I loved it. I think when we, when we last spoke, we talked about um, talking around um, the foundation to great coaching. Um, so maybe it makes sense for you to tell, tell me a little bit more about uh, what you mean by that and possibly a little bit more about your, your actual journey and, and, and what led you to the realizations you now have. Okay, cool. That makes sense. So, um, as you said, I was a, I was a good athlete, a very, very successful um, high school here in the States and then college hockey player, ice hockey player. Um, and then took up, took up golf shortly after my hockey career ended and turns out I was pretty good at that too. Uh -huh. um, without going into the tournaments or whatever, the awards and all that stuff, it's not really relevant. Um, I, what, what I suppose is relevant to a certain extent is I had a, a real love for sports and for competition mm -hmm. and also for, for the camaraderie around sports. You know, I always really, I just loved it. Um, and when, when my athletic career was over, um, well, it's really why I started playing golf. I wanted to remain competitive at something you know, and hockey was, yeah. was done. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a bunch of injuries and stuff like that and some knee, many knee surgeries throughout my years playing college hockey and it just kind of took its toll. Um, anyway, I also thought that uh, I could remain competitive in sport through coaching. Mm -hmm. So I looked into coaching ice hockey and I became a very successful or semi-successful um, high school hockey coach prep school, had a very, very good prep school team here in New Jersey. Um, so as I started my business career, which was not in this, in what my ultimate career was, Intersports was, wasn't even started yet. I, I, I was in the real estate business. I, I maintained my, my, my attachment to sports through coaching and also competing in golf tournaments. Mm. So hockey in the winter, coaching, playing golf tournaments in the summer, and somewhere in the middle of that I found time to work, <laughs> a little bit of time to work. Um, anyway, when I was, when I was um, for those of you who don't know me, when I was in my mid-20s, um, I, I was struggling um, psychologically. Mm -hmm. Kind of hit me out of nowhere. Um, in hindsight, like everyone else, I'd had my ups and downs, but for some reason, this down was just sticking with me. Mm. And what I had grown up believing, you know, believing was the source or the baseline for excellence, whether it was on the, on the ice, on the golf course, in life, um, in relationships, in coaching, what I had believed and been taught was that when you're struggling, the key is to grind through it or push through it or fight through it. Yeah. So when I found, and that would have been, that's how I, that's probably why I got injured so much in hockey. So um, when I found myself in this, in this low state of mind, in this persistent low state of mind, the answer for me was to grind through it, was to fight through it. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means I was going to, read every self-help book on the market. I was going to um, see therapists. I was going to exercise like crazy, try meditation, some yoga. I mean, if there was a coping mechanism, I was going to try it. All right. And, and, and luckily, it, didn't, it never turned to illicit coping, me coping mechanisms, but that was probably coming. That was probably, that would have happened if not for what I'm about to tell you. So, I did that and I was striving and I was pushing and I was grinding for mental clarity and all I was doing was stepping on the gas pedal with my tires in mud. I, I was, I was getting, getting worse. After about a year of this, I said to myself, hey, you know, 
something's just not right here. Um, so until you can find what's going to work, why don't you just do nothing? Why don't you just stop trying to force mental clarity or happiness or whatever? It yeah. sounds almost funny to say it like that, but yeah. that's what I, that's the realization I had. And the cool thing is now, by the way, I didn't, I wasn't saying that I wasn't going to do anything. I just was saying to myself, I haven't mm -hmm. found it yet. So I'll just do nothing until I find what's going to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, lo and behold, after about a week of kind of being semi miserable, but not trying to fix it, I subtly noticed that my, my feeling state had improved. Mm -hmm. and I hadn't felt that way in a year. And I didn't really pay attention to it, not much, but I kind of went about my business some more, not trying to fix or figure things out. And about a week later, I felt that my feeling state had really improved. I mean, significantly improved. I, get, I gave it another week. Let's just see what this is, where this has taken me. And I would say after about three weeks, I looked at, the, I looked at myself and I said, wow, I feel great. And I have not done anything. I had I had not done anything to get myself here. I I had I had somehow taken my foot off that gas pedal that I talked about, and slowly but surely the mud dried and I was pulling the car out of the hole, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it was just an amazing realization that wait a second, ninety nine percent of coaches have this backwards. Every coach I ever had had taught me that the secret to success was busting your butt, mm -hmm. you know, working your tail off, grinding harder than everyone else. And, and I believed it. I bought it. And the exact opposite sensation was just happening within me over the past three weeks. I had, hadn't felt this good in years. It, so it occurred to me, and I didn't say it quite like this, but it occurred to me that the mind is designed to self-correct if we just stay out of its way. So if we, if we get in a low spot and we don't try to fix it, we are built to, we are built to get over it. We're, we're built to overcome. We're innately resilient. A bunch of different ways to say it. And when I saw that, what I also saw was an opportunity. And the opportunity was to make this my career because nobody, I mean, I had been around sports my entire life. My father was a coach. My brother was a good athlete. My sister, I, I just grew up in the world of sports and I had never heard that before, you know, and if people were talking about it, I would have heard it. I was just, was too and I, I was, I was right in the middle of this community, this athletic community. And I, I had consulted people and I had, studied it and searched for answers like this and nobody was saying this so i saw that opportunity like it was just so obvious that this is what i was going to teach for the rest of my life and that's just, that's the that's the backstory of how inner sports was created and what i've been doing for the past 25 years of my life and that's really the backstory so um i suppose what we could what we could then say is that the the the, the baseline for great coaching, and this, this is not obviously just athletic coaching. This is just, this could be coaching. This could be teaching. This could be parenting. This could be being a great friend yeah. and anything like that. Being a great husband, wife, partner, whatever. Um, the baseline for, for all of that, the, the great, the baseline for supporting other, other people is, is knowing that, the, the human mind is built to fix itself, yeah. is built to fix itself. If as individuals and as friends, coaches, parents, teachers, whatever, we stay out of its way. So an example of that would be if I had a client who's, let's say, playing in a golf tournament, I work with a lot of professional golfers and uh, very good players. And uh, if one of them was struggling, kind of in that low place that I described, I found myself in years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I want to do as a coach is give that player strategies, techniques, 
tools, methods, approaches, whatever, to help him out. That's exactly what I was doing 25 years ago. And that's exactly what was taking me further and further away from mental clarity and peace of mind. Sure. So if that, and, and if, you know, some people who are new to this perspective, let me, let me just explain why that is, why that is. Human beings are only as good as the thinking in their heads at any given moment. What I mean by that is, if you or me or anybody listening to this or any, anybody finds themselves in mental clutter, let's call it, mental clutter, a cluttered mind, yeah. which means they have a lot of thinking going on, a lot of noise in your head, that person is going to feel lousy. That person's perspective on life won't be so great. Now, the same person, same exact person, who finds him or herself in, with a clear head, not a lot of thinking going on, that person's going to feel great. That, pers that person's perspective on life will be wonderful, fantastic, optimistic. Now, the interesting thing about that is nothing's changed on the outside. The outside's the exact same. It's, however, so, so our perspective on the outside will always be based on how much thinking we have in our heads at any given moment. Okay, that makes sense, I suppose. Now, if a, if a coach, if anybody who's listening to this as a coach is going to give a client a mental strategy in order to clear their head, in order to feel better. A mental strategy requires thought. You cannot employ a mental strategy without thinking. And what I just said two minutes ago was that a person with a lot of thinking will feel bad and a person with a little thinking will feel good. So any mental strategy is gonna be adding thought, thus, you're on your way to feeling worse, not better. And it's, it, now listen, it's very easy for us talking about this, you and me, because we, we, we're kind of immersed in this perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for us, oh, oh, isn't that just so obvious? But I can guarantee you, if coaches are new to this perspective and you're hearing this for the first time, you're gonna sit back and say, how could that be true? Because every single mental coach, sports psychologist, psychologist, Therapist, they are doing exactly what I just described. The whole paradigm is if a person is struggling, let's give that person something to do, something to think about, and help them out of their funk. So, an example of that could be we're going to go back to their past. Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's a Freudian example of that. You know, that all started with Freud. We're going to take the person back to his or her past. And we're going to figure it out, what's bothering them and what, why you are the way you are. And that's going to help you now. Well, in my mind, there is no proof whatsoever that that's helpful. And there's a lot of proof that that's hurtful. It's, it, it, there's just no way going back to the past can help somebody figure anything. It, it's, if, if something was bothering a person in the past, what was bothering them in the past was their thinking. It wasn't the circumstance. So if we go to the circumstance, we're looking in the wrong direction. They were looking in the wrong direction 20 years ago, and they're looking in the wrong direction now. Yeah. Right? So that's an example. Another example may be po think positively. That's another example. We're going we're gonna to think positively. Well, fact of the matter is what we've found is that it doesn't really matter what kind of thinking a person is doing. So if you, if you go back to what I said a few minutes ago, I said a lot of thinking, a person doesn't feel so good. A little thinking, a person feels very good. I didn't say a lot of positive thinking or a lot of negative thinking. I just said a lot of thinking. What we found is it doesn't really matter what the person is thinking about or what type of thinking the person is doing. If we, so if we try to think positively, in essence, we're adding thought, and that will lower our state of mind. So yeah. I love my wife dearly. If I sat here and said, I love Liz Kramer 
30 times in a row, I'm going to, my state of mind is going to start, go right downhill. <laughs> right? I'm just jamming my head up. I don't care what I'm saying. It doesn't really matter. And after about the third one, I'll be like, do I love Liz Kramer? I'd be start wondering whether I really love her or not, which is funny. Yeah. So, so, you know, and whereas, whereas, you know, this is kind of a, a little bit off, off, off the, uh, what we're talking off topic, but I don't think at all, I don't have to think to know I love Liz Kramer. It's a feeling that comes over me. I don't have to think about that. That doesn't require any thought. That's the clear head we were talking about. Yeah. So what we're saying then, in essence, and I hope clearly is yeah. to, to coaches that, look, what we need to do, the paradigm that we're looking in is a, here's my swivel chair. This is a, okay, if a person's struggling, well, if Garrett Kramer's struggling right now, the reason I'm struggling is because of X, Y, and Z out there. Yeah. That's the old paradigm. This paradigm is saying, okay, Garrett Kramer's struggling, and the reason I'm struggling is in here, mm -hmm. is in how much thinking I have going on within me at this moment in time. Yeah. Now, the cool thing about it is this is a never-ending wild goose chase. This is a, you know, okay, I'm struggling. Let me think. Of, let me try to figure out why, where, what part of my life, what it is. Mm -hmm. I, I can go, I can find right off the top of my head a hundred things that are bothering me if I look in this direction. Yeah. This direction is, is one answer, my thinking. It's me in the moment. When we look in this direction, as I was doing 25 years ago without even knowing it, <clears throat> The mind has this, again, has this amazing ability to self-correct. If we look in this direction, as I said before, we step on the gas pedal with our tires in mud and we sink lower. Now, someone may wonder, well, I don't, I don't agree with you. Or, or they may ask, I don't agree with you. I've, I've felt bad and I've, I've figured out the reason out there why. And I've used this strategy and I fixed it and I felt better. That's happened. That's happened. And where, where I disagree with that is, is in this. I, I agree that a person, and this is, includes me, by the way. This ha has happened to me. Let's take me. I felt bad, and I've made the mistake of looking outside, and I've tried to fix and, ex and, 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 and mold and work and grind and all that, and then I felt better. What's interesting, though, is let's take in the world of sports. You've got a, an athlete who is not playing well or something, and he uses this technique, mental technique. And that night, he goes out and he plays great. Great night on the field, right? So what does he do the next night? I'm going to use it again. And he use, uses the same mental technique, and he doesn't play well. So what I'm suggesting is, in the, in the example of, for me, my example, and then the athlete's example, it was never the technique or the looking outside that led to the mental clarity. It was the mind's ability to self-correct that led to the mental clarity. It was just a coincidence. Sure. So we often get duped into believing that it's something that we do or, or, or an outside in direction that we're looking when in essence, it's simply the, the human mind has this amazing ability to self correct. Another way to, to term that would be a psychological immune system. What happens, however, over time, over time, the more we look in this direction, again, I feel lousy. The reason I feel lousy is because of X, Y, and Z. And in order to fix my feeling, I'm going to use this A, A technique, B technique, or C technique. The more we look in that type of direction, the more we inhibit or block or obstruct our psychological immune system. And, it, and you'll, you'll see in life, people who are continually looking outside for excuses and for fixes, as they grow, they, they, their ability to self-correct lessens and lessens and lessens and lessens until they're ready to go insane. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. And so I'm suggesting that answers are never found in that direction. 
Answers are found in not looking in that direction when you struggle, when you feel bad. Answers are found in understanding that we're feeling the random ebb and flow of thinking. And if we look in that direction, we will tend to trend upward. Our states of mind, our level of consciousness will tend to trend upward more often. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that makes some sense. <laughs> yeah, it completely makes sense. And um, um, just looping back to something you said that, that this, um, you know, it kind of seems obvious once you get it. It does to me. And then there's some days where I get caught out again by this whole kind of outside in illusion. And, and, and when you talk about people have the experience of looking outside to fix things, I would say for the first 30 something years of my life, I thought I was having a hard time because life's hard. And then I had this insight that I was having a hard time because I believed that life's hard. And I had that insight in the context of an NLP training. And then I thought, oh, right. So what I need to do is fix my thinking. So then I spent several years on the path of realizing it is of thinking it's not life I need to fix. It's my thinking I need to fix. And it's, it's very persuasive because you, you, you use some techniques and just by coincidence and sometimes maybe just because your mind's quieter um, during certain certain techniques that involve say um, getting into a more meditative state of mind so you have an insight which is just the mind's natural tendency and um, for fresh new thinking to flow in when you allow it and you mistakenly attribute the insight and the the the, you know the new sense of well-being that comes with it you mistakenly attribute that to a technique and then so my experience was then that I was giving the power to these external techniques to fix my thinking and so I had exactly the same experience that you just described where um, you know I'd be doing something and I'd believe I need to be calm in order to do this particular thing or I need to feel confident in order to do this particular thing so I would do a technique that, you know, would help me at certain times. And then on the day when I really need it, it wouldn't work. And then I was in a worse state than ever because I believed that I needed to feel a certain way in order for this event, this situation to go okay. And I needed this situation to go okay in order for me to be okay. And it was just, it felt like it was working, but it was a little bit like that. I think it was called whack-a-mole where as quickly as you could knock down a negative thought or a limiting belief, um, another one would pop up and it is never ending. And yeah. Well, you said so many, um, uh, true things, <laughs> you know, everything, everything you said was just so, so true. And I think what we're pointing to in mm -hmm. essence for coaches is that if you want to make an impact on another person's life, You know, I, I, I believe this so strongly. I, I don't, it's, it's, it's going to sound like a personal belief, but I, I know it's not. So just yeah. bear with me. Okay. If you want to make an impact on another person's life, you've got to speak truth. Yeah. And there is no truth in an approach or a method or some kind of psychological technique, motivational technique. There's no truth in that. So what, what you're, what, what, what rings, true to me about what you were saying is, is just that. In other words, a thought technique, a mind strategy, doesn't represent truth. So there's no truth that if you employ a positive thinking strategy that 100 times out of 100, you're gonna feel good, you're gonna feel positive. There's, and everyone who's listening to that is gonna say that, there's no way you could disagree with it. Yeah. We've all done it. Yeah. We've all done it. I don't know what the percentages of feeling good after we do it are, but it's, it's never going to be even close to 100%. I guarantee it's, it's not even close to 50% if you really look at it. But, but let's just say it's, someone's going to say it's 85% and that's good enough for me. And I'm going to say, no, it's not. It's not good enough for you because you're, you're selling something that has no staying power. First of all, it has no power at all. Again, it wasn't the positive thinking that led to the good feeling. It was, the, the psychological immune system that did that. 
in the first place. But you're selling something that is has is is totally empty. This this it's a it's a total fallacy that it has any power, right? So you're not selling truth. Now, yeah. what's true is that the the mind has an an ability, as I said before, to self correct. Everyone has felt that. We have all been in dysfunction a dysfunctional state of mind and then for no reason whatsoever we look around and say man what just happened two seconds ago i was like a mess and i feel okay now Every, everyone who's listening to this has felt that and if you're saying and if you're listening and you're saying to yourself yeah but it doesn't happen very often well the reason for that is because you're doing because <laughs> you're looking in this direction and and if you're looking in this direction that means Th those you're coaching are looking in this direction. So there's, I'm going to get this stat, and I'm not a big person. I don't love data, but this is there is some stat out there that says that in couple therapy, it, it like has a 92% failure rate. And not only that, the therapists have been divorced like at an 89% rate. So there you have it. I mean, it's not that the, the, the therapist is not trying to do his or her best for the client. They, they are. However, they're employing the same outside-in strategies with their client in their own lives that they're using with their clients, and it's not helping them and it's not helping their clients. It's not helping their clients. What you'll find is people who generally teach an inside-out paradigm that we self-correct. Those people, if you look closely, their lives – have really taken a turn for the better. There's, if you, yeah, it, 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 it's very interesting. Like you'll see a level of consistency and realness and genuineness and and productivity and and you know you're just kind of yourself. And you know, I thought to say that you don't have your ups and downs. You do. You absolutely do. And not to say that if if you were a a coach and you've been divorced or whatever, that's a problem. It's it's not a problem. It's it's all fine. But what what you find is that um, what what I'm saying in this is if you're gonna to be a productive coach and this is a life coach and any type of coach the baseline for what you teach has to be steeped in truth if it's steeped in these these this guesswork then you're you're not helping people. You're not helping people. You're not even helping people in the short term. Sometimes people will say, well, I can give them some short-term help and get them. To I don't even believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. I don't even believe that to be true necessarily. But again, we're saying that we're saying two things. We're saying thought, thought is this kind of ethereal principle that fills our heads and then empties. People call that flow sometimes. Mm. So it's the flow of thought. It's it's filling our head. You can liken it to energy. It's filling our head. It's and then sometimes it gets backed up, and sometimes it just flows through us. So in little small children, for example, you'll see a very even and and uh, smooth flow of thinking. You don't see them getting caught in their in their troubles very often. And if they do, it doesn't tend to stick for very long. Mm. As we grow, though, and we can talk about why that is. We, we we gotta get caught up in our heads a little bit more. Right? So someone may say, my wife may say to me, What's the matter with you? You, know, well, you, you all right? And my answer would be something along the lines of, um, I'm okay, babe, you know, my thinking's just got the better of me right now, or something. Or or um, yeah, it's got a lot of noise in my head. I'll be all right. And that happens. That happens. Yeah. Now it'll happen to the degree that I don't try to fix it. <laughs> if I try to fix it and I try to make excuses for it, I'm going to get stuck in it for a while. If I kind of just understand that, you know, it's just the ebb and flow of thought. Uh, and right now thought is ebbing in my, in my mind and I'm kind of jammed up before you know it, that'll be out there and I'll be back to being, okay, this is cool. I'm, I'm, I'm raring to go. Um, so the, I'm speaking truth right now. And I'm not speaking my truth. I didn't make this up by any means. And maybe how I talk about it is, is, is it sounds like me, I guess. But what I'm, the, the crux of what I'm saying, I have nothing to do with. It's just how we all work. Yeah. How human beings work. And we want to keep pointing to this, to truth, to truth, not to supposition, not to guesswork. This is guesswork. 
as successful. Yeah. Now, I also want to be clear that when you, when you talk about mental strategies, coaching strategies and all this, um, it's not to say that positive thinking or meditation or some of these or, or deep breathing or visualization, big one in sports, um, are wrong. I, don't, I want to be clear about that. I'm not saying they're wrong. In my mind, to suggest the use of, let's say, a deep breathing technique, which is so common, deep breathing technique, to your clients when they're stressed out as a, as a coping mechanism, I don't think that's a good idea. I think that's pointing your client in the wrong direction. That's a far cry from me sitting here at my desk. Maybe I'm working on my book or whatever or whatever. And I go, you know, that, that's just a, if I need a deep breath, I'll just take it. That, you know, I'm kind of wired that way. Yeah. You know, that's kind of a basic uh, instinct that I have that when I'm not breathing properly or I need a deep cleansing breath, they call it, it just kind of happens. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, to suggest that as a strategy, though, it is, is going to have the client doing all sorts of, you know, unnatural deep breathing and all this stuff that, 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 that clearly is, is, not, is not helping. Is not helping. So that's a, that's a, that's you know sometimes a, a, in in sports a, a client will say to me, "Well, I I visualized this play happening and I saw it happening." Now you're telling me visual I shouldn't visualize. I said, "Well, well, no. When our heads are clear, we see the future. We we tend to be ahead of the competition. We we see it playing out. It's called deja vu. Yeah. You no, know, that doesn't happen when your head's cluttered. Yeah. So so so." That is innate. You're meant to do that. But you're not going to get to mental clarity by deliberately fooling yourself into doing that. It's just, you don't work that way, you know, in my mind. And again, doing that adds, adds thought. Doing that adds thought. And clearly that's going to take your low, a lot of thought, lowering of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make much sense to, Use these again. Use these deliberate strategies in a quest to find mental mental clarity. Yeah. <clears throat> Another thing I've I've kind of thought about when it comes to using techniques is if you're using techniques to 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 fix the way you're feeling, you can only fix what you can see in the moment. And if your level of consciousness is low, then you're limiting yourself to to that level of consciousness. Does that make any sense? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're not equipped. Yeah. You're, you're not equipped to fix anything if your level of consciousness is lower. So anything you do in a quest to feel better from that low mental state, that low feeling state, low level of consciousness, whatever, you're really not equipped. That's 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 me. That's stepping on the gas pedal with the tires and mud. You're you're not even capable. Um, yeah, it, it's very important to understand that when I, I talk about the roller coaster analogy a lot, and the human mind and the human experience is really a roller coaster. Mm. Okay, that's kind of what's cool about being a human being in my mind. Yeah. It's a roller coaster, and when. When we're at the top end of the roller coaster, it's like you could see forever. Your consciousness is just on high, right? Your, your, your perceptual field is just super wide, right? That's the top of the roller coaster. That's consciousness. What does that come from? It comes from a clear head, okay? Now, as thought ramps up, and why does thought ramp up? I'm sorry, I can't answer that. It just happens. <laughs> it happens to all of us. It happens to all of us. And if we look to circumstance to explain it, we're going to miss it. So some things are better not better left unanswered. Yeah. Thought ramps up, and our, and we start to plunge down on the roller coaster. Now, as we get down here, we're kind of in this little valley here, and the roller we can't see so well. Like our our vision is blurry. We're blocked. Now, as we come back up, we can see again. 
what I'm suggesting, what you're suggesting, is that when we're down here, we're not seeing life clearly. It's kind of like I use this analogy, like you're wearing Vaseline glasses with Vaseline on the lenses. It, 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 it's blurry down there. Yeah. So you're not seeing life right. So it wouldn't make sense to force or fix or do anything from down there because you're really not seeing it right. Your judgment, your judgment is questionable. So what, what do you do? Well, and again, this is based on understanding that you, what you do is you hold on to the sides of the car and you just go for a ride. And before you know it, you're back up here. That's a far cry from suggest from, from, from the, from the coach or, or suggesting to your client or to your player to, okay, here we go. We're plunging down. Oh, we got to make a change, which is a constant thing. Make change happen when you feel bad. Don't be a doormat. Don't, don't settle for second best. And Okay, so what should you do? Why don't you pull the emergency brake, get out of the car, and fix under the hood? Well, now you've stalled out something that's not even broken. Now you've 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 you've, you've increased your time at the low. If you had just hung on before you knew it, you wouldn't even have noticed the dip. Yeah, you wouldn't yeah. even have noticed it happened. So we're not only are we do we have the system wrong? We're, we're suggesting to people to fix something that's not even broken we're telling them okay if you if you feel bad go meditate and you'll feel better wait 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 i don't need to meditate i just need to hang on to the roller coaster of the car and just whoop, before i know it i'm back up now i'm not saying that meditation is bad or good whatever as a coping technique however in my mind, the odds are you're going to stall out the low. And that's why people sit in meditation and look around and wonder, is, anybody, is this working for anybody? Because it's not working for me, right? It's because it, it, it's just, it's not, it's, it's not capable. Meditation is not capable, in my mind, of clearing your head. Now, again, you may go to meditation and come out with a clear head. You may not. But those times when you go to meditation, when you, go, when, you, when you practice meditation and you find yourself with a clear head, that's because the roller coaster has trended upwards. It's, that's why. It's not because of the act of meditation. There's a big difference between the act of meditation and finding a meditative state. And you can find a meditative state in the middle of Times Square on New Year's Eve. It, it, it doesn't matter. Now, I, I did a, a webinar yesterday, and we were talking about this. And um, some woman in Denmark um, wrote me an email and just went, just took off on my perspective uh, on this, and it really criticized it. Real, and and I don't, and that's fine. But I, I you know, because that's what she teaches. Yeah, that's what she teaches, and, I, and I'm not. You, you have to understand, to everyone listening, I'm not telling you not to teach meditation. It, it's fine. I'm. I'm just. I'm just asking that you reconsider teaching it as a stress relieving technique. Sure. That I. I, I that's what I'm saying. It's wonderful to mm -hmm. meditate, and I, it's fine. It's cool. It's great. But if we're but we're pointing people in the wrong direction to suggest that they need to do something in order to find mental clarity. That that is that is just untrue. Yeah. That is untrue. If you had a two year old who was in a had a, having a temper tantrum and all all stressed out or whatever, would you ever suggest to that two year old to meditate? I mean, it, it would be. And however, that's being done. We start, we're seeing that now. We're seeing these types of coping strategies, you know, and, and, we're, and we're talking about those coping strategies that people perceive to be the right ones, like mindful meditation and all this stuff, yoga and all this stuff. We're seeing this more and more now with young people. So rather than fostering their innate ability to self-correct, we're giving them coping strategies in order to help them self-correct. It is absolutely the wrong direction, and I, I'm positive it is. It's not that, and it's not that I, it's my opinion. Yeah. Two-year-olds 
they have a meltdown and before you know it they're, they snap out of it yeah without doing anything we need to look in that direction and but and we need to look in that direction not only for young people we need to look in that direction for every everyone and we yeah. clearly you know o over the last you know hundred years we're clearly looking in the opposite we're looking in this direction yeah. not not this direction yeah I was um well, a couple of things, actually. I was just going to say, I was listening to Dick and Bettinger talking about meditation a couple of days ago. And he was talking about the fact that he used to have an incredibly anxious experience of life and that he, um, at one point, he was meditating for several hours a day. And he did find if he meditated for several hours a day, he could quiet his mind down but only to achieve a state that is now naturally accessible to him, you know, an awful lot of the time. And I guess it's, I guess what you're saying is that the danger is that when we, when we meditate, we, when we treat it as a fix for a world that is stressful or um, a fix because we don't believe we have that inside us anyway, then we actually look in the wrong direction and, and take ourselves further and further from our own ability to self-correct and our own uh, natural state of, of, of well-being and wisdom. And um, the other thing I just wanted to, to, to kind of comment on as well is um, to do with children. It's just, it's an area very dear to my heart and I discovered this stuff um, when my oldest was at, um, a few years old and um and um, I used to want to interfere a lot more with, um, with the way he was experiencing stuff and, and to, kind of, to, to kind of help him have a better experience of life. And then, and then once I saw my own ability to self-correct, suddenly it was as clear as day that it's right there in him and I don't need to do anything about it. And actually, the more I keep my fingers out of his machinery as well as my own, the, the better and better he gets. It just... Uh, yeah, it, yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. I, yeah, it's so well put. Um, I, I remember, um, I may have told you this, but um, I don't know, my oldest son, uh, Ryan, who's now almost 23, he, he, uh, I don't know, he must have been five years old, I, maybe six, I can't remember, and um, Liz, my wife Liz, was struggling with something with Ryan, mm -hmm. and I remember it was still relatively um, uh, early in my career in, 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 in counseling and teaching. Um, and my relationship with, I, with my collegial relationship was, were just forming with people like Keith Blevins and Dickin and George Pransky and stuff. Anyway, so Liz was struggling with Ryan and she's insisting that she's going to call the psychologist, local psychologist to help her through this. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, you can call, you can call somebody, but you're going to call either George Pransky or Keith Blevins, and that's who you're going to call. Well, they're already all, all the way in the Connor Washington across the country. I said, I don't care. You can call them. We're, you, you're not, oh, come on, this great psychologist from New York City, which is close to us. And I'm saying, I, maybe there are, but that's not, that's a, that's a crapshoot. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to keep this in house, so to speak. So I remember it like it was yesterday. So Liz sets up this point with Keith. And I know, so I'd say the appointment was like one o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And I say that to Liz, I said, listen, babe, I'll be in the office. Call me when it's done, when you're done. I want to, I want to recap. Okay. So now, now in, in Liz's mind, she was really struggling with something, which for her doesn't happen that often, which was interesting, but she just was up in her head about something with Ryan. Well, she asked what she thought anyway. So. I'm waiting by the phone, and at about 1.20, the phone rings here in the office, and it's Liz. 
And I'm like, oh, that was quick. Now, I knew this was going to happen. Like, I, 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 I saw this playing out. So I said, that was quick. Wow, 20 minutes. She goes, yeah. I don't even know what to say. I said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, Keith told me the problem was me. <laughs> had nothing to do with Ryan. <laughs> we didn't even talk about Ryan. I had everything prepared to talk about Ryan. I had all the problems listed and everything. And Keith just told me it was me. I don't really think he said anything else. I said, perfect. See you later. Click. And that was the whole thing. So, you know, that's kind of what you you just said. Yeah. You know, he'll figure it out if you stay out of his way. Yeah. And along the same lines, I had a I have a client who plays on the PGA Tour and uh, great player, great guy, great everything, great client, friend, you name it. And uh, we started working together last March, so almost a year. And uh, I remember one of the first things he said to me he goes, "Never mind golf. I, I, I gotta I gotta figure out how to deal with my daughter at the dinner table." <laughs> He's, she's four. He goes, I, I, I'm going to kill her. She goes, she is, she never forget golf. If you can help me with that, we'll be fine because she's impossible. I mean, we can't even have a family meal. She's, it's horrible. It's okay. So it was very funny. I kind of forgot about the comment. And uh, I don't know. It was about a month ago. We were getting ready for this, the, the PGA tour season, which is now just kind of kicked up here. Yeah. And uh, for some reason, oh, no, no. What happened was he was like, and I, I, I could see his life has taken a, a fantastic turn. He's just, a, he's just, a, just looking in this direction. Yeah. You could see how the, the edges come off of him. He's a, he's a gentler, softer, uh, whatever. Just, it just his whole demeanor has changed. More open, generous, compassionate, you name it. It's cool. Yeah. Oh, hi, baby. Speak of the devil. That's Emma. Hi, Emma. Hi, Ben. We're, do, we're doing a webinar. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't. I thought maybe I was. <laughs> we were just talking about you and Keith. That's good. That is you. It's never me. Don't worry. I'm going to sing this song. No, babe. Come on. Get out of here. We're, we're working here, sweetie. Okay. Bye, Emma. You see this? Bye. 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 Nice to meet you. you. Imagine. Isn't that funny? Okay, so let me try to remember. Okay, so look at this soup, beautiful. So, so, um, and I want to be clear, by the way, with with us co with coaches. Like, you may say, well, just to, to just to go off the topic a second, you may say, well, is he more competitive? And the answer is yes. He, the fact is, he's more open. There, there, there's yeah. direct people think that's the old me thinking you got to be er uh, to be competitive. Yeah. That's just not true. Yeah, and it's, he's already playing great, so. The proofs in the pudding. Anyway, one thing he said to me, one one thing he said to me was, well, you know what? This is all good. Life seems better, yada yada. But uh I wanna I, I gotta play well. I gotta start playing well. So let's let's talk about me playing well, which is fine. You can say that. Mm -hmm. So I said, Well, how are things at home? He goes, Good, everything's good. I said, Well, how are things how are things at the dinner table? He said, What are you talking about? I said, how are things at the dinner table with Maya? That's her name, Maya. She goes, oh, yeah, 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 Maya, right. She grew out of that problem. <laughs> so I just started laughing, right? Yeah. I mean, she, she's, she's, she's almost five. She, she, you know, you don't really grow out of it yet, she, if you do, but if you ever do. But, you know, I just started laughing. It's, what's so funny? I said, you mean to tell me? That Maya's already grown out of that the, the dinner table problem. That's got nothing to do with you. He goes, ah, oh, yeah. So in, in essence, and it's something we haven't discussed yet. He learned through this work, through this direction. He learned where his feelings are coming from. Mm -hmm. His feelings are coming from his thinking. Again, as I said before. When he had a lot of thinking, Maya is a problem. A little thinking, she's not a problem. It's him. It's not Maya. Okay? It was Liz. It wasn't Ryan. Same with you. Yeah. It's not the outside. It's us. Yeah. Always. So what? how did that play out? Why is she no longer a problem? Why does it look like she's grown out of it? Well, because when he's jammed up, his perceptions 
of Maya are going to be bad, horrible, even though it's just, he loves his daughter, but it, it's going to be a problem. So if he tries to fix it from there, he's not capable. Yeah. He's going to lash out. He's going to discipline, punish, scream, whatever. And it's going to energize Maya's bad behavior. It's not going to help it. So now he's, he kind of let it go. And he didn't let it go, like try to let it go. It just stopped making sense to him mm -hmm. to try to fix things when he was seeing it that way. Not to say we should put up with kids throwing food at the dinner table. I'm not saying that, but from a, a clear state of mind, we'll know exactly what to do and it will not come across like you're an ogre or a disciplinarian. It'll come, the, the kid will get what you're saying. Yeah? It's all up to you. It's not up to the, it's not about the kid. So as he stopped looking in that direction, slowly but surely, her behavior will just naturally clean itself up. Yeah. It's kind of happened in our house, not with Liz or me, but with my daughter, the youngest, and, and, and my oldest, Ryan, and Chelsea. If Chelsea would kind of be looking for attention when she was younger, she would kind of act up looking for attention, you know. She'd loan me on a totem pole or whatever in her mind, and, and Ryan wouldn't like the way she was acting, so we would always kind of lean on her, and mm -hmm. it would just make her act up more. And it wasn't until I said, Ryan, you just got to look. Don't pay attention. I mean, just keep your mouth shut. It'll go away. You feed that. It's going to be. And exactly the same thing happened with this player and his daughter. So what we're suggesting here, and it's very important, is that we see that we don't, you know, if we're going to start digging for excuses for the why, why we feel the way we feel and, and fixes, we're, you know, we're just giving, we're just going on fact-finding missions to blame the outside. Mm. We're, so we're continually looking in the wrong direction. It is far simpler and far, obviously, more natural to just say, wait a second, it's me. Mm. And that's why the call was only 20 minutes with Keith and Liz, because once Keith explained it, he knew better. As a coach, Keith knew better than to go deeper into that. He didn't have to. It was up to Liz to figure it out for herself from there. In other words, that's all she, Keith felt Liz needed to know. It's not Ryan. Get your butt, head out of your butt, and it's you kind of thing. Yeah. You know? And the minute you see that, it's like, whoa, that's true. Same with this player and his daughter. Same with you and your son. Same thing. It's, it, it's so easy to get caught up in there, isn't it? Because it's... I mean, less and less so these days, but, but certainly at first, it feels counterintuitive because when you get an uncomfortable feeling like something's a problem or you're stressed about something or you're anxious about something or whatever, it feels like that problem is telling you that, uh, that feeling is telling you you need to do something about the problem. Um, and actually, all it's telling you is that your thinking's not to be trusted at that minute, but exactly. it's taken. Exactly. We can't. That's, that's cool you brought it up. I, I probably would have forgotten. The fact of the matter is that thinking happens too quick to catch. Okay, mm -hmm. That's what our feelings are for. So what happens to us, and this is really important for, for mentors, coaches, so important to see this. Again, thinking happens too quick. We cannot grab hold of it. The after effect of our thinking comes in a feeling. Okay. Now, remember, the thought has kind of come and gone, but the feeling's still there. So because the thoughts come and gone and the feeling's still there, it's very natural, as you just said, to look outside to try to explain the feeling. Okay, so an example I like to use is, let's say you get cut off on a highway, okay? Yeah. And <clears throat> thinking ramps up, whatever. Now that's not happening because you get hot, caught, caught off on the highway. Let's just say thinking ramped up, you get cut off on the highway, you feel angry, guy cut me off. Yeah. Because the thought's already gone, it's going to look to the person that's driving that the person that cut him off, her, him or her off, is the reason for anger. 
Mm. It looks that way. It looks that way to me, and I teach this for a living. No doubt. No doubt. But that's <laughs> not how it's how it works. There is no sensors from a circumstance being cut off to your feelings. There's no connection. There's nothing connecting that. There's no, you know, our colleague Jamie Smart would say there's no transmitters from the circumstance to your feelings. Yeah. There's a transmitter from your thinking to your feelings. You're, they're connected. We call it the thought-feeling connection. There's a connection there. There's no circumstance-feeling connection. That's just made up. Yeah. It looks that way, right? So we get cut off on the highway. Nothing wrong with getting angry. You don't control that. However, if you understand that this is true and that's not true, we work inside out. We feel our thinking. We don't work outside in. We don't feel our circumstances. If you know this is true, then even though you're angry, you won't tend to that. You, you, and even though it looks like that guy who cut me off is causing my anger, we know better. We keep driving. No road rage here. We're not going to take from this world, right? We're going to set it. We're going to set example of resilience for this world, and we keep driving. And the coolest thing is, by the time you get to your office or home or wherever, you forget that that even happened. Yeah. It, it, it'll be out. You, you won't. Someone would have to. Remind, be like in the car next to you, and then go to the same place and say, "Man, that guy really cut you off." And you, like, what? Oh yeah, right. I didn't know that. That could, it would it would automatically be gone. You won't even remember it happened. Yeah, that's a far cry from saying, "Oh, that guy made me angry. I don't want to feel angry. I got to go fix him. I will now. All hell breaks loose. Now you've just destroyed." That guy's life, your life, probably other people's lives. You've taken a lot. You've taken from the world. You haven't. You've done the exact opposite, and this is and this type of and this type of behavior is rampant. Now, mm -hmm. circle back to the paradigms. What what we're doing as coaches to fix this type of bad behavior: road rage, bullying, I don't know, whatever, right? Disrespect, yeah. whatever. We're giving strategies to fix the behavior. That's the, that's where we get we we miss it because. The behavior is actually irrelevant. The behavior came from a lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. The lack of understanding. So that person who would commit road rage, he just doesn't understand where his feelings are coming from. So we can't give him things to do to fix his behavior. Take a deep breath. Think about things you love. Be respectful. Here's this checklist you should go through. Think positive, whatever. It's not, not even, even telling him to have, have understanding and compassion or love isn't going to work. He's not capable. He believes his feelings come from the outside. This person made him feel bad. And in order to feel better, he's going to have to fix the person. It's almost logical based on that lack of understanding. So our role as coaches is to up levels of understanding. No, your feelings aren't coming from the guy that cuts you off. Your feelings are coming from your thinking. And what will tend to happen when people start to see it, they'll say things, huh, that's interesting. Interesting you said that, Garrett. You know, other day I, I got cut off on the highway, and I usually get mad when I get cut off on the highway, but for some reason, I didn't really get mad. I actually felt bad for the guy that cut me off. They'll start to see that it's not the, it's not the guy that cuts you off that makes you mad. It's your thinking, and your thinking's variable. Yeah. So when your thinking's ramped up, you'll get mad. When your thinking's not, you won't. So, you know, the other day I was having lunch. Liz and I were having lunch with a friend of hers and her husband. I don't like to talk about work, really. Um, in the unless people really want to know or talk about it whatever but he was pressing he didn't know much about my work and he was pressing yeah and he goes tell me about your work i said you know i'll make it easy on you i said when my here's what i teach i said when my state of mind is low when i've got a lot of thinking going on 
Liz is a pain in my neck. When my thinking is high, she's the greatest thing that ever, my, my state of mind is high, she's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. That's all you gotta know. And I swear, I, you know, I didn't know how I was gonna take it, but whatever. And he looked at me like, oh my God. Like I could see that that statement rang so true to him he had a shift at a change of heart type level. I swear that he saw it and like, wow, yeah, it's me. It's not Karen. That's his wife's name. It's not Karen. It's me. Oh my God. I've been gotten this wrong for 50 years. I mean, it's hilarious. Right. And I could see it in him. You can see when people are moved that way. And you, I actually see his eyes welling up a little bit. He, a, a sense of relief kind of came over him, which was just super cool. And that's what, that's a byproduct of this work. You'll see that a lot, you know. And I didn't really need to say any more. You know, that was the Keith Blevins moment with Liz. I, he didn't need to say any more. I didn't, I didn't need to say anything else to him. He saw that. And you know, I'm not going to say that their marriage is going to be, the, you know, perfect from here on out. But I can tell you that. It's going to be a little different. I could tell that he had a little bit of a shift. Not a little bit. He had a lot of bit of a shift. Um, and again, that's a far cry from if he was having a problem at home, giving him a strategy, a marital strategy at the times when he is having a problem. That's not going to work. That's yeah. not going to work. If he knows his feelings are coming from him, not Karen, then he'll know how to navigate through the, hot, the ups and downs. He'll know. So, yeah, it's, it's again, we're talking about, it, you know, we, we've, our conversation's kind of taken some cool twists and turns, but at the end of the day, what we're saying is that, hey, you feel your thinking. I feel my thinking. Everyone listening to this, this feels their thinking. We, we do not feel what's out there. Mm. The variable is not out there. The variable is in here. Okay, a lot of thinking ramps up. Life kind of looks bleak. Our head's clear. Life looks wonderful, beautiful. I'm saying believe the beautiful. Teach people to believe the beautiful. The yes. beautiful is true. The beautiful is true. Doesn't mean that everything's got to like, whatever, you know, if you lose a game or a client, whatever, it doesn't mean you got to like it. But trust me, as your head clears, it'll make sense to you. And, and that's the perspective. As coaches, you've got to grab hold of first. If your level of understanding isn't there, you're not going to teach that. Now, you're going to teach it to a certain degree because even people who teach this paradigm, they're still saying this even though they don't know it sometimes because mm. this is how everyone works. Yeah. So it, it's not shrouded to a 100% degree. I mean, even, even madmen like Hitler – Hitler had some level of understanding in him still. It was covered up to a large degree, but maybe 1% of 1% of the time, he did speak truth. Yeah. I mean, even in someone that outside in and so looking in the wrong direction, every once in a while, his psychological immune system fired up and he did come across as loving or respectful or whatever. And then mm -hmm. he was thinking he would ramp up and he would get back into, mm -hmm. you know, blaming others for his feelings, of course. But... It's in there, mm -hmm. um, and, but, but I'm saying to coaches that, hey, if, we, if all you got to do is look at the self-help profession, okay? There have been a million theories out there. There's a million theories about how to coach, how to help people, how the mind, how the brain, body, whatever works, all this stuff. Is the overall level of consciousness on this planet getting better or worse? It's getting worse. So we need to look in a different direction. And by that, I don't mean a different approach. I mean a direction of, tr in the, I mean, we need to look in the direction of truth. No more approaches, no more personal opinions on what great coaching is because they don't work. And, and there's no sustainable, it's not sustainable. We need to point people in the direction, hey, your feelings come from the inside, from your thinking. And the more you look in that direction, the more you're, you foster your innate ability to self-correct or your psychological immune system. That's the direction we need to look in. 
There's no strategies in that. There's no uh, mantras or inspirational things or things to practice or study. It's how you work. It's how everyone works. And if and, and coaches, you can't, in my opinion, this is my opinion now, this is personal opinion, you cannot be black and white about it. It's got to be, this is the paradigm. If you start selling a mixed paradigm, your client's going to get be all over the place, which is what happens a lot. So some people said to me, like some, somebody asked me a question yesterday, isn't, isn't meditation inside out? Like, so how, why is that a mixed paradigm? And I said, well, again, again, it's, it's, a, it's a coping strategy. So meditation, mindful meditation as a coping strategy is built on pure misunderstanding. It's built on a misunderstanding. So you may say, well, we're going to have, in a lot of companies now, you're seeing meditation being taught. Why? We're going to relieve work-related stress. So in our company, because we have work-related stress and we're going to want to lower the stress level. Well, that's built on the misunderstanding that stress can come from work. Work cannot create stress. That's that direction, outside in. Only thinking can create stress. So to use a strategy to cure something that's a misunderstanding to begin with cannot work, can't work. No, it's just couple that. What's that? Are in the wrong direction. Yeah, it's just it's all over the place. So anyway, we're 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 really saying, I'm actually saying, okay, coaches, hey, it's awesome to want to be a coach. Like, if you want to be a coach, if you want to, you know, if, if you want to commit your life to serving other people, that, to me, nothing's better than that. I don't care if you're a sports coach, a teacher, a counselor, uh, you work in bullying prevention or alcohol abuse or mar I, whatever it is. If you're in that field, if, you, if that's something that's near and dear to your heart, to me, there's nothing, there's nothing, you're a okay. I mean, that's awesome, right? However, however, you, it to sell your twelve secrets to mental clarity to the world doesn't work. It ain't gonna help. It isn't gonna help, you know. And the seven secrets to happiness isn't gonna isn't gonna help. And that's the direction where, where someone's approach, someone's personal approach, it's not true. Yeah. So I'm suggesting that we look in the direction of truth and we do it unequivocally. I mean, we just, we, we don't, we don't waver. Now, the last thing I'll say on this is, look, I'm not saying that we don't, we, that, that slipping up isn't, it's going to happen. I, I know I do it sometimes. In other words, everyone does it. All coaches do it. So. Mm -hmm you kind of jump off the path, you miss it for a second. But our obligation in my mind is to just get back up, dust ourselves off and go back in the direction of truth. Completely. If that makes any sense. So. Completely. I, I am just talking about that. I know when I first, when I first got this, um, you know, I, I kind of had this little transition period where I get a, I, I guess I just didn't get it deeply enough because I wanted the security blanket of of the the strategies and the techniques and stuff that I'd um, that I'd been using, and I kind of thought I had this idea um, that I still had this question. It was like, well, it's absolutely changed my life, but do I totally believe that it can change other people's lives? And and I was, I was speaking to Michael Neal one day and he said, you're basically saying that you really, really love ice cream. You really, really believe in ice cream, but you don't, you're not sure other people will buy ice cream. So you're going to sell apple pie as well. And, you know, I, I thought about it, but it was, I thought it was fair enough. And um, another thing I just want to say on, on that kind of point is, although, you know, because quite a few, a few coaches, um, I was doing this interview and, and they were fairly new to this to this understanding and 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 possibly you know questioning well what have they been doing up until this point and you know have they been doing something wrong kind of thing but 
one thing I'd say is, although it's not necessarily easy, I think this approach makes things so much simpler because you're not trying to fix anything. You're not looking for a whole host of kind of complicated problems, causes and whatever to fix. And once you really see that we've got our own psychological immune system, that we do self-correct, we see that every one of our clients has got absolutely everything they need anyway. And, and I think that's kind of a good thing to think about when, when people are questioning whether they know enough or not to do this, because we're designed to have insights, we're designed to have fresh new thinking, and we're designed to self-correct. And, and obviously the more, the deeper us as coaches can understand that and, and kind of inhabit it, you know, the more useful we'll be to our clients. But we, but we can trust in them because they've got it. They've got it anyway. If only they stop looking in the wrong direction. Yeah, it's well put. You know, I, I think, I think like you, many people will get a little up in their, you know, as thought ramps up, they'll, they'll feel like, okay, what am I going to teach? What am I going to code? What I, if you're taking away my techniques and my strategies, what am I going to, sell to people what am i going to offer i have nothing to offer and i don't know how long we've been on the we've been talking i have no idea but we've just you know we've just filled that's got to be close to an hour right i don't even know it's, over. it's an hour and a quarter just wow so right so so and we all we've done is it's just we've talked about truth we've talked about you know how the system works and as a result, we both have learned and our level of consciousness has, has grown. And I can promise you, you will have so much to talk about. The conversations will be so mind-blowingly interesting that I can guarantee anyone who's worried about that, it's fine to be worried about it. I totally get it. But you, you, you consciousness and understanding always has room to grow there is no end to the learning it's almost like you know that's the danger in writing books about this you you like i look at still power the book you were talking about earlier which was really written in 2009 i don't even i mean it's so far removed from my level of understanding now even though it was just five years ago or six years ago whatever right it it's not even close. And I just finished the second edition of my new book and I, I'm already saying, oh my gosh, I'm already like, I want to write about what we talked about today. So, <laughs> so it's, it, there's never, yeah, you're, there's, there's always, um, yeah, you know, it'll, how you see it now is not how you're going to see it in two weeks, let alone two years. It's just not. And I, I can promise you, you're, it's, it's, awesome work like forget about that i believe in, in my core that this is the most important work on the planet i, I don't even think it's close i don't again d d you we we can, you can't have a war if people understood where their feelings come from mm. so so we, we we can't have people dying in the streets or homeless in the streets if people understand where their feelings come from. It's you know they wouldn't end up there and we wouldn't let them end up there. It's not even possible. So this is the most important work on the planet. But the like I was saying before, it is so much fun. The the it's it's. And, and it's opportunity as a coach. I was saying to somebody yesterday, like, because he was saying, man, I feel better. We were talking last night, and he said, man, I feel better. Thanks. I'm like, well, guess what? I feel better, too. <laughs> now, it's not just you. And he goes, what do you mean? I was, well, well, this is what happens when you look in the right direction. There's a natural self-corrective effect of that, as we've said. And that's, it's, that's the benefit of this work. I mean, it's wonderful work. Uh, you know, I mean, and I, and I, I'm not going to say it's always easy and it's not, you know, it's, it, 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 we could talk about the business end of, the, end of it in a different time, but, um, 
yeah, 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 it's yeah, just yeah. wonderful work, and and I promise everyone is listening. If you're wondering, like, what am I going to teach? It, it, there's plenty, plenty. There's, yeah. there's plenty to teach. I think that would be both a, just a really wonderful and a really helpful thing for coaches to hear. Um, yeah, really helpful. Cool. It's cool. um. In fact, it's probably a wonderful point to finish on if, um, yeah. Yeah. if that seems a good place to stop for you. Good. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, and thanks ever so, so much for your time. I've really, really enjoyed the conversation, and I know that everybody who listens to it will get a lot out of it as well. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. And maybe I'll tap you for another one at some point. Okay. Anytime. Okay. Anytime. Thanks, Garrett. All right. Peace. All right. Peace. Bye, Bye. for now. Bye.